Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights and expression. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, hosted by me, Nico Perino, where every other week we dive into the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. Today we're focusing on the rapid advancement of artificial intelligence and what it means for the future of free speech in the First Amendment. Joining us as we navigate the complex and ever-evolving landscape of free expression in the digital age are our guests, Eugene Volk, a First Amendment scholar and law professor at UCLA, David Green, the senior staff attorney and civil liberties director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Allison Sherry, a partner at the law firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. Eugene, David, and Allison, welcome onto the show. Thanks, Nico. Thanks for having me. Yes, glad to be here. I should say that introduction was not written by me, but rather by OpenAI's popular artificial intelligence chat chat bot, uh, ChatGPT, with just, I think, one or two tweaks from me there on the back end. I think it's fair to say artificial intelligence technologies have advanced quite a bit here in the past few months or even past few weeks and taken many people by surprise. It's not just ChatGPT, of course, which you can ask questions to and it can churn out surprisingly cogent responses, uh, but there's also Dolly, which creates AI images, Volley, which turns text into surprisingly human-sounding speech, and then there are tools like QuickVid and Make a Video from Meta, which produce AI video. So to start this conversation, I want to begin by asking the basics. Should AI be granted the same constitutional rights as human beings when it comes to freedom of speech and expression? And if so, how would you define the criteria for AI to be considered as having First Amendment rights? And I should ask, that, con- that question itself was generated by AI. And I know, Eugene, over email, you had a quick take on this one, so I'll let you kick it off if you're willing. Yeah, so rights are secured to... Uh persons let's not say people necessarily but persons well what's the Uh, difference right so they reflect our sense that certain entities ought to have rights because they have desires they have beliefs they have thought um so that's why humans have rights you can you can imagine if somebody were to show that you know orangutans, let's say, or whales or whatever else are sufficiently uh, mentally sophisticated, we could say they could have rights. Um, corporations and uh, have rights because they're because humans who uh, make up those corporations have rights. But computer software doesn't have rights as such. So the real question would be whether at some point we conclude that some AIs are like enough to us or are thinking enough that they have desires that things matter to them and then of course we'd need to ask what rights they should have which is often very much based on what matters to us so for example humans generally have parental rights because we know how important parenting is to us i don't know what an ai what what would be important to ais perhaps it's different for different ais i think it's way premature to try to figure it out now there's a separate question which is whether the First Amendment should protect AI-generated content because of the rights of the creators of the AI or the rights of users of the AI. I mean, I'll just give an example. Dead people don't have rights, not in any meaningful sense. But if somebody were to ban publication of, uh, uh, of uh, say, Mein Kampf, it wouldn't be because we think that the dead Adolf Hitler has rights, it's because all of us need to be able to, uh, excuse me, it would be unconstitutional, I think, because all of us need to be able to read this very important, although very harmful book. Um, so uh, so I think there's a separate question as to whether AI-generated speech should have rights, but at this point, it's not because AIs are rights-bearing entities. Maybe one day we'll conclude that, but I think it's way too early to make that decision now. Well, as a basic constitutional question, maybe David, you can chime in here. Like, what does the First Amendment protect? We talk about the freedom of speech. Is it the speech itself, or is it because that speech is produced by a human that it therefore needs protection? Or is there just value in words strung together, for example? Well, I, 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 I think the First Amendment and freedom of expression as a concept more broadly protects the rights of people to express themselves or, or persons or or collections of people that form entities. Um, 
I, I, I agree with Eugene that I think AI is best looked at as a tool that people, persons who have rights use to express themselves. And, uh, and so when we're talking about the rights framework around AI, we're talking about the rights of the users, of those who want to use it to create expression um, and to disseminate expression and those who want to, and those who want to receive it. And, and I do think that's, that's in every other context of the First Amendment, that's what we're, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the value in expressing oneself um, to others. But is there a reason we've historically looked at it that way? It's because it's only ever sentient people that have produced the expression, right? It can be produced no other way. Now you're creating a technology that can take on a life of its own and produce expression uh, that was never anticipated uh, by the the so called like creators of that artificial intelligence, and if speech and expression has a val- has like an informational value, uh, and we protect it because of the informational value it provides to say democracy or knowledge, is there an argument that that should be protected as well? Well, I'm going to come at this, I think, as a litigator, um, which is you know <laughs> just just to be like totally practical. We can kind of, you know, hypothesize about the constitutional theoretical underpinnings, but when push comes to shove, the way the law gets made is in is in lawsuits, and you have to have a person to sue. And so, if somebody is going to bring this case, they're going to sue the, you know, the owner of the 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 person who distributed the speech, or the person who created, or the entity that takes ownership of or develops the, you know, the. The, the the like the AI system that's what's happening with with current ones so I think as a practical matter when these First Amendment uh, arguments get made they're they're inevitably going to be made by people and it's either going to be the person distributing saying this is my speech or it's going to be the developers of the algorithm saying you know this is my speech in the way it's it's the way it's put together and it's also the speech of people who you know give the prompts to it etc. But I, I just I just have trouble kind of thinking of, you know, other than a monkey selfie kind of situation, which got which got quashed, you know, got got squashed by uh, that's that's, you know, kind of the most on point precedent. I have trouble what what is that case for our listeners? Oh, who sorry. Aren't familiar so the with monkey it, selfie yeah. is when uh, there was a, uh, a, a monkey, a, a macaque, I think, took a took a photographer's uh, like a nature photographer's camera, took a selfie and then the photographer was distributing it, and I think it was PETA, right, sued as the next best friend of the monkey, arguing that the monkey had copyright because the monkey was the one who pressed the button, and um, they lost. And there is no standing for a monkey to assert copyright because it doesn't have the rights, you know, that that are contemplated by the Copyright Act. So I, I have trouble seeing where it's going to get in the door to even adjudicate a first amendment right for um for a for an ai you know kind of itself right so i i like the litigation frame i think it's very helpful so there let's imagine a couple of things let's imagine somebody sues uh chad gpt uh uh or essentially the owners of of that they sue the company that runs it um and they say you are liable because you're your product said things that are defamatory, let's say. One thing it could do is it could raise its own First Amendment rights. That's our speech. But it could also raise third-party First Amendment rights. So it could say, well, it's not our speech, but it's the AI's speech. And we are here to, to protect that. And there have been quite a few cases where, for example, a uh, book publisher could be could raise the rights of its authors, let's say. Uh, or, in fact, uh, a speaker can raise the rights of its listeners. There are there are cases along those lines. Uh, I don't think that that's going to get very far because, again, courts will say, huh, why should we think that it has rights? Like, do we even know that it's the kind of thing that has rights? So I think instead the publisher will say, or the publisher, excuse me, the, the, the company that's being sued will say, we're going to assert the rights of listeners, that if it's publishing these things, it's going to be valuable to 
uh, to our readers. And it's true, the readers aren't the ones being sued here. But if you shut us down, if you hold us liable, readers will be denied uh, this information. So we're going to assert uh, their rights. And again, courts are, are quite open to that sort of thing. And I think the answer will be yes, readers have the right to read material generated by AIs, regardless of whether AIs have the right to to convey it. The same thing would apply if, for example, Congress were to pass a law prohibiting, let's say, the use of AI software to either prohibiting it altogether for the use of it to answer questions, or maybe imagine a rule that says that AI software can't make statements about medical care. Like people would be asking it, like, what should I do about these symptoms. We don't want it to do that. So. Or it has to be disclosed. Uh, like a compel- well, right, right. You could have a disclosure requirement, but the easiest example would be a prohibition. Again, I think the AI software manufacturers would say not so much, oh, the AI has a right to play doctor. Rather, it's that listeners have a right to gather information for whatever it's worth with whatever disclaimers are there, and the, this statute interferes with listeners' rights. I think that's the way it would likely play out uh, in court. And I do think I do think Nico that your question sort of assumes an inevitability of sentience uh, um, uh, from AI that I, I don't know that we're I, I don't know how close we are to or whether we will whether we will ever get there. But I, we are certainly not there right now. And um, you know I hate to be one of those tech lawyers who talks as tech you know, who tries to make analogies to like you know the stone age and things like that but you know but we've we've all there's always been tools that speakers have used to help them compose and create their speech and i do think that ai is best thought of in that way now and maybe there will be some tipping point of sentience and we'll have to think about whether or not there's no remedy for someone uh there's no remedy for speech harm because the speaker, uh, there's no one to defend the speech, and maybe we would get there. But I, I don't think we're there yet. And I, I think it's actually, I, I think that it's a, it's a bit dangerous from a human rights perspective to give AI this in this this decision making that's independent of those who who do the inputs into it as those who give the prompts. Um, because there's a, we will, it leads us to sort of a magical thinking about AI and that it's inherently objective or that it's always making the correct decision. Um, and I don't think that's great to actually disengage it from the responsibilities when we're in, in a harms framework from those who are actually inputting data into it and giving prompts. There's a really still a very significant human role um, in what AI spits out. Yeah, I, I asked that question because as I was preparing for this conversation, I talked with some of my colleagues and said, hey, what, what would you want to ask uh, David Ellison and Eugene? Uh, and as we know from popular culture uh, surrounding movies made by artificial intelligence, often they involve artificial intelligence that reaches sort of a sentience that's, that passes the Turing test, right? Where they have an intelligence that is indistinguishable from human intelligence. And there's this popular horror flick out right now called Megan, starring an AI-powered doll that gains sentience and <laughs> murders a bunch of people while doing TikTok dances, right? Like, and so they were like, well, what are Megan's free speech rights, you know, putting the murders aside? And then, of course, there's the Positronic Man written by Isaac Asimov a while back, right, which became the Bicentennial Man where featuring Robin Williams when it was made into a movie. Um, you know, that was essentially a story of a lifelike robot petitioning the state for equal rights. Um, and... I, n- I never like to kind of close my mind to the possibility that technology will do miraculous things in, in the coming years and decades, right? I think if you would ask someone 150 years ago about um, virtual reality, they just wouldn't have even been able to conceive it. Um, and with the advancement in AI in the past three months, you know, the the sort of images that tools like Dolly are turning out um, – in some cases are just blow my mind, you know, uh, images that look like someone drew a portrait that you would have paid thousands of dollars to see. But I want to get back to this question about liability, right? So you know, the classic example for artificial intelligence or the classic worry from those who are very worried about artificial intelligence is, okay, you'll ask AI to do something and you won't be able to anticipate its solution to that problem. So you ask AI to eliminate cancer in humans, and it decides the best option is to kill all humans, right? That'll eliminate the cancer, for sure. So when AI takes a turn, 
is is it the programmer who is responsible, for example, if they defame someone if, or if the artificial intelligence incites violence? Or is it the person who takes the generative product and publishes it to the world? How should we think about that? I think it's got, I mean, I think that what David was saying about thinking of AI as a tool is the right thing here. If you just let, you know, a robot come up with how are we going to solve cancer and then just go with it and have no kind of humans in the chain and like checking whether this is a good idea. Like that seems pretty negligent to me. We have claims that can, that can account for that, you know, all the way up to, you know, all kinds of uh, tortious, you know, all kinds of torts, but you know, having, having an algorithm, like being able to come up and run the numbers and come up with solutions and then having a human to look at those and call through it, but kind of doing the computation, I think that's, that's a tool. And so then it's, you know, if you, if then a human kind of makes the decision to publish something or to act on something, you have a person to hold liable because it's the person who, you know, kind of took that recommendation and went with it, which, you know, is the same thing regardless of who's making that recommendation. So one of my favorite poems is Kipling's The Hymn of the Breaking Stray. It's got some deeper things going on in it, which actually I don't much care for. Those those don't work well for me. But it's in some measure a poem. It starts out as a poem about engineers. Here, here are the opening eight lines. The careful textbooks measure, let all who build beware. The load, the shock, the pressure, material can bear. So when the buckled girder lets down the grinding span, the blame of loss or murder is laid upon the man, not on the stuff, the man. I used it in my torts class when I used to teach torts, right? <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, the bridge isn't negligent. The creator of the bridge may be negligent. Maybe the owner of the bridge is negligent in not maintaining it. Maybe the user of the bridge is negligent in driving a truck over that's, that exceeds uh, the, the posted limits. Um, now, to be sure, note there's one difference. The careful textbooks do not exactly measure what AIs are going to be able to do. In fact, one of the things that we think about modern AIs is precisely they have these emergent properties that are not anticipatable by the people who create it. But it is the job of the creators to anticipate it at least to some extent. Um, and uh, uh, if they are careless, this is a negligent standard, generally speaking, for these kinds of things. If they are negligent in their design, if, for example, they design an AI that can actually do things, that can actually inject people with things, and then they're careless in 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 uh, their uh, any fail safes they put in, they're careless in what the AI could inject people with, then in that case, the creators will be liable, or perhaps the users, if the carelessness comes on the part of the users. But the user's going to sign uh, a release, no matter. I mean, you're not going to do that in the real world without somebody signing away every possible... Well, my release. understanding... And I'm sure it varies sharply from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But at least in my own state of California, um, there are limits to uh, releases as to, for example, bodily injury. They're not always they're not always enforceable. In fact, in many situations, they're not enforceable. So, for example, a uh, uh, hospital can't say, as a condition of coming to this hospital, you waive malpractice liability. You can't do that. Uh, so, so uh, again, it may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And, you know, what if the AI is not even in the U.S.? What if the AI is in Slovenia? And who knows what Slovenian law is on this kind of thing? Maybe it's in a place which specifically, deliberately has law that that is relatively uh, relatively producer friendly rather than relatively user friend uh, relatively consumer friendly. Uh, but the important thing is, generally speaking, the creator is going to be subject to a negligent standard. Or again, depend it doesn't have to be the creator; it could be the user, it could be whoever whoever it is who contributes who contributes to this. Now, one difficulty, of course, is often in trying to figure out what is negligent. Like, what if the AI does have some capacity to manipulate things and you know experts come to the stand and they say well you know they did as good a job as they could have we think uh, it, will the jury believe that it wasn't negligent or will they say no 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 surely you must have been careless and not anticipating this particular harm uh, 
Interesting question. There's also the question of what if the AI only provides recommendations? Does the First Amendment provide some sort of defense against a negligence cause of action in the absence of knowing a reckless falsehood, let's say this is the libel or actual malice standard and such? So those are interesting questions. But in principle, again, I think we need to look to the people behind the AI. Uh, whether, again, it's creation or it's adaptation or it's use, and not to the AI itself. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I mean, I do think the answer here is sort of the nerdy lawyer answer that is going to depend on the mens rea of whatever the tort you know, tort claim is and whether that's going to be a negligence claim or, or you know, as we often have in free expression cases, a, a higher a higher more demanding mens rea standard, a you know, subjective intent standard. And then, and then to what extent any act is going to be a negligent act is really going to depend on that particular AI, that tool, that the moment of time and what the known risks are and, and the, you know, all the context about what, whether someone, you know, whether the, the user, you know, what, what they, what they knew about the tool and its propensity to, you know, to give, wrong answers or, or, or say harmful things. Uh, I, I do think it will end up, uh, it will end up playing out that way. We'll, we'll be looking at this just as a standard, uh, as a standard mens rea problem. I want to ask about fraud and misrepresentation there. I've seen some futurists posit online that we'll be able to eliminate a lot of our email inbox by just training artificial intelligence on how we typically respond to emails and having it uh, go through and respond for you. Do you think there are any concerns about fraud or misrepresentation there? Uh, you know, another another example, right protected under the the First Amendment, is the petition uh, of government for a redress of grievances. I'm just thinking here about activists uh, at organizations, not unlike Fire, who might train artificial intelligence to make it seem like there are more activists in support of them. Uh, who write and call uh, their congressman or woman uh, with unique emails generated by AI or even unique voicemails that are left at uh, the congressional office generated by AI, but it's really just one organization or one person trying to say, it's kind of like the bot problem, right? That you have. Yeah, I mean, I feel uh, like this kind media. of exists nominally. Like there are nominally. Yeah, yeah. FCC, I think, had uh, kind of uh, leveled some accusations about it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like this, I think this exists. This is just a more efficient version of here. We have a bunch of letters. Please sign your name here and we'll send them all out. In I mean, you know, it's not. It's it's slightly different because there is a human attached to each of them, but in terms of being organized by a central, you know, organizing force, I think is not is is not like a totally new issue. It's just probably the volume. Yeah, and I think it's to totally possible under the law for someone to commit fraud by the use through the use of an AI tool. I don't. There's nothing in the law that I can think of that would where that would bar liability because the fraud was committed through the use of an AI tool as opposed to any other any other tool. So I, I think it's certainly possible and there's probably lots lots of examples and um but I, I don't see any any obstacle to that. I don't think I would trust AI to respond to my email, certainly not at this point. Certainly not as a lawyer. <laughs> so uh all that sounds right to me, but I let me point to a couple of things that I think are implicit, Nico, in your question. Uh one is what if we're not after what would normally be actionable fraud or misrepresentation, like somebody say, signing Eugene Wallach and it's not actually me, it's actually an AI, let's say. That might be in some situations fraud. But, but what if it's just sort of an unsigned letter and it looks like it's a human, but it doesn't say that. And, you know, maybe it's not reasonable to just assume that it's a human who's sending it. So what about disclosure mandates? What about a law that says any email sent by an AI has to be flagged sent by an AI? Which again means that any email that a human authorizes to be sent by an AI has to have this disclaimer. Is that impermissible speech compulsion? Again, compul impermissible violation of the rights of the human who is create using AI to create this? Or is this a permissible way of trying to prevent prevent people from being misled. And a second related question is, there, um, uh, relates to the fact that 
there is a right to petition the government, but there's no obligation as a constitutional matter on the government's part to respond to the petitions. So, for example, you might say, if if you're a government agency, you might say, um, we're not going to prosecute you for sending us AI comments on some rule or some such. You know, you want to do that. That's fine. You have every right to clog our inboxes. Uh, 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 that That's not enough of a harm to justify, at least unless it's like equivalent of a denial of service attack, uh, not enough of a harm to justify uh, uh, punishing that. But we will ignore, we will just not pay any attention to anything that doesn't have to say at the bottom, I certify as a human being that this was written by me, signed the name of the person. And then if I send that certification through an AI, then I am committing possibly, for example, the crime of a false statement to the government on a matter within its jurisdiction. That's 18 U.S.C. section 1001, perhaps. So <laughs> it, it may well be that... Uh, uh, that uh, uh, the government will and others will have to set up similar such rules to say, look, you know, I'm only going to respond to messages that aren't from AIs. Uh, more broadly, you can imagine email facilities that actually do say, look, you know, at, at least from with things sent by people whom you don't know, one feature we will offer our users is the option of saying block all material that isn't certified as being from a human because the last thing you want is your email box clogged by all of the, this bot mail. Uh, and if that's so, then again, somebody somebody bypassing that by false certification would be committing fraud. I think one of the, and I, I think maybe related to this kind of how do you solve the way people might solve the problem? Because the problem of all this is like the generation of junk, just creation of junk mail, junk, you know, just the drowning out of the the real people in the mass of like the cacophony of not like speech created by by non-human means. And I think the what's going to happen potentially is systems that place a premium on verification not necessarily something clicking a box, but maybe you're holding more town meetings. You're, you're maybe you're holding more hearings in person, where in a way that can't be gamed as much. I mean, it can also cause, you know, if you're making policy, maybe you're not reading the comments and you're really talking to the stakeholders who you know who they are, and that's kind of how a lot of laws have been made for a long time. Maybe that's not so different than what's already going on. You know, I, I'm not sure how like diligently every random person's letter into the agency is being read as opposed to the briefs that are, you know, the papers that are submitted by people that they know and have connections and have the ability to go in and, and you know, push for their position. So I'm not sure that I think it's going to exacerbate a problem that already exists. And maybe what we might lose potentially is some of the ability for kind of the democratic access um, that comes with being able to petition the government or, you know, kind of show up as somebody who doesn't have a way to like get in the door already because you might round out in like the unverified mass. And and you wonder whether the big problem ends up being that the government either doesn't believe that there's a popular, you know, support or popular opposition to something because they're making some assumption that it's it's some bot that's just spitting out these things or the you know that was a that was a beautiful letter in opposition, probably written by AI, so I can just ignore it. Right? I, I, you, I get more concerned about about you know about uh, official lawmakers having some excuse to ignore really really valuable input because they've been convinced that it's you know it's not the work of, of real humans. Or they're not convinced, but they understand that they can dismiss it in that manner. Not to be cynical. I think I'm the cynical voice on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have family that work in. Con- I have family that work and or worked in congressional offices, and uh, one of the things when constituents or anyone calls into the office is that one of the first questions they ask is, are you a constituent? Are you in the, this district, right? And if the answer is no, then they they don't really can, can continue the conversation. But if the answer is yes, they, they hear the complaints and they log it, right? Um, and then for emails, they log all those emails too. It actually surprises me how many of these offices log every constituent concern or complaint. Um, but the problem, of course, with AI is, are they really uh, a constituent when you're talking about uh, text to audio? Uh, they might sound 
like a constituent or say they're a constituent, but that would be speaking to Eugene's point, a kind of misrepresentation or fraud that's already accounted for uh, by the law. I think a big concern there would mostly be the uh, sort of denial of service type thinking that Eugene was talking about, right? You only have so many people that can answer the phones in so many hours in a day. Uh, and if you keep getting bombarded with AI, then unless you use AI to sort through it. <laughs> Unless you use oh, AI. hurdles all the way down. <laughs> exactly. Uh, although I wonder, I wonder whether we might, whether it might be good to think a little bit about human AI partnerships, right? So, so my sense is that there are a lot of people who might say, you know. I have some thoughts about this, but I know I'm not the most articulate person. Uh, I'm not sure I have the best arguments for this, but I'm going to use AI to create a better thing, better thing that I would have myself done. Uh, but I, I will endorse it, or maybe I'll edit it a little bit, or I'll review it and endorse it. Or there may even be people who say, you know, it's just, I need to write up a letter about something, so I'm just going to let it do the first draft. The way I think a lot of translators use translation software, they realize translation software is far from perfect, but it provides a good first cut, and then that cuts down the total translation time. Uh, so one interesting question is, what should we think of that? I think it's good. I mean, I think that saving, you know, you have a, so much kind of mental capacity in a day in a week and saving that for the for the tasks that are the highest and best use can be good if within if you're talking about like within my job maybe I'm a really good editor but I it takes me forever to write that first draft well maybe this is a way that like get a bunch of words on the paper and then you know I would I love when someone else right. writes the first draft. but let's think about this specifically with an eye towards the submission of comments to say a administrative agency or whatever else so on one hand we could say you know it's actually fairer to people who may not be as articulate or may not be as experienced with doing this to use the comment writing bot and then they have to review it and then sign it on the other hand if it turns out that a lot of people as a practical matter don't sign it and what they do is they get kind of ad advocacy groups to uh, advocacy groups submit little prompts saying, all of our fans, why don't you run an AI using this prompt? And then, of course, edit the results as you think uh, uh, is necessary. But as a practical matter, people just submit it this way. And you get all the problems. It's true. You do have somebody's at least formal statement. I endorse. I am a human and I endorse this message. But it may not be practically that uh, uh, th uh, that realist or th th that much of a human judgment there. The other problem is to the extent we do use AIs to detect AI written stuff, which in fact we academics have been thinking about uh, uh, whether we can do that to, to, um, to deal with AI-based plagiarism. Like what if somebody submits to us a paper? How do we know that it's uh, uh, written by an AI? Well, we may write it through the AI-based AI detector. Part of the problem, though, is that presumably it would detect material that is written in its first draft and then only slightly modified as AI-generated material. If you think it should be accepted so long as a human endorses it, then you wouldn't really have the option of an AI being used to sort through all of this spam AI-submitted things because the human-endorsed version looks just like the one that is just submitted by a bot. Yeah, I mean, I think we're not going to out-computer the computer. Like, it's always going to be, it's always going to be a race. Like, Someone's going to, it's, it's like encryption, you know, like somebody's going to come up with something better and then it's going to get, you know, some, it's, it's just going to be kind of like this, that's this, oh, sorry, this is a podcast. This is me saying one after the other. <laughs> there is a video component of it okay, too. Good. <laughs> so it's turtles all the way down. You mean elephants all the way up. Turtles all, elephants all the way up. Exactly. Um, but I, I think I read in, there was a op-ed, I think it was in the times recently that I thought was pretty compelling. It was about people who are kind of it was taking the opposite view of like rather than let's try to stamp out plagiarism instead being like people are going to use this this is a new tool it's important to have literacy let's use it to say you know when when we give a prompt of write x in the style of y like what is it drawing on why is it in the style of y what elements of it are are reminiscent what things is it getting wrong and having that kind of rather than this, you know, fear of technology, which I think is is 
old, very old, the radio, the TV, like phones, everything. Like we're always afraid it's going to be the end of the world and maybe just kind of learning how to, what to do with it and what its best use is. And I, I think, I think trying to, to trip it up is not going to necessarily be a productive or reliable thing because we can't always know that we have the best algorithm to, to, and it may be wrong. And so maybe just assume people might do it and have that not be the point. Have the, you know, have learn how to incorporate it even into affirmatively into a, into a lesson. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's right. And my understanding is that like journalists have been experimenting with using, uh, the chat GPT to, you know, to do first drafts of articles to just see like, you know, and, and I think you, we have these tools, right. And we should learn to, we actually should, we should learn to become comfortable with them. And, uh, you know, those of us who are like, just like naturally beautiful writers, you know, and have had this advantage over everyone else because we can, you know, effortlessly spit out beautiful text. I mean, we might, this might be an equalizer and we're going to have to find our advantage someplace else. Right. But I, I, I do think we, I, I agree. We can't be, we, we can't be sort of running away from these things or trying to like impose equities on them um, that really aren't, really aren't necessary. Well, so as a, as a general matter, I think, I think that it's right that the stuff is coming. It'll be here to stay. It'll be getting better and better. We have to figure out how to adapt to it. At the same time, if my goal as a professor is to, to measure a student's mastery of particular knowledge, I can't accomplish that goal now through an essay that they write, especially at home. Um, uh, if ChatGPT can pro can write comparably good essays, or you could do an oral exam still. Yeah, that's how they do it in Europe, right? Right. So we may need to change things to to to, to do that. So so in a sense, we are we're not running away from the technology, but we are essentially saying that this technology threatens the accomplishment of a particular function. I don't think the solution is to ban the technology generally. The solution may have to be though to change the function so it can't use the technology. So as to oral exams, you know, I appreciate the value of them. That's not as good a solution, I think, in many ways, partly because it's more time consuming uh, for for the graders, and partly because my sense is that uh, uh, oral exams, first of all, are further away from what m lawyers do. Most of lawyers' work is written, not oral. So, uh, so um, uh, they, they measure things a little bit less. And there are also lots of opportunities for bias in oral exams that are in, in some measure mitigated. There are other opportunities for bias in written exams, but they're considerable measure mitigated in written exams. And I'm not even just talking about race and sex. It's just sort of like appearance and manner, right? Everybody likes the the good looking and the fun seeming. And in writing, thankfully, I can't tell what somebody looks like or how fun they are. I just look to see what they're actually saying. So in any event, I do think that the AI stuff is going to be potentially quite harmful to to the way we, we do ac academic evaluation. Again, I agree we shouldn't ban it, but we shouldn't also ignore the, the fact that, that it should lead us to think hard about how to prevent this kind of cheating. No, no, I, I, I agree that I think the cheating thing, right, is something we have to we have to deal with. I also think we have, I mean, you know, there was the calculator conundrum, right, where, uh, you know, I, this was when I was uh, a student, was when calculators became mass available, there was this big question about whether to, whether to allow their uses in class, or was it, was it a better, th and, you know, ultimately, it was really, they exist, and people have, it's better to actually assess people with their facility with the tool, than to pretend the tool doesn't exist, and to require that people have this, you know, have this capability, and, and then we did the same thing with, with search, um, I remember when I was first started teaching, there were big questions about whether you could people could use Wikimedia, right? Be Wikipedia, because it was too easy, you know. And, and the, I think one of the ways I think we have to do as educators is get over this idea that there's some nobility in having people do it the difficult way. And, and one of the things we can do is to teach them how do you use available tools to do to do your excellent job, right? I, I understand the assessment gets we have to change what we're assessing. Um, and maybe we're assessing the output with the use of the tool instead of the output before the use of it. I was watching a Instagram Reels or maybe it was a TikTok video the other day of a attorney, a real estate attorney in New York City, 
who asked chat GPT to essentially draw up a re, uh, real estate contract with these specific terms, like standard New York language this, with this force majeure and, you know, this jurisdiction and, and it spit it out in like four minutes. And then he, you know, you split screen it and he goes through clause by clause each, um, each term. And he's like, this is pretty good. This would save me hours of work. And I just go in here and tweak around the edges. So it was, it was, he was viewing it as kind of an augment to his work. And I will say, as I was asking chat GPT to write up the, the introduction to the show, introducing these guests, you know, saying, you know, we, every other week, you know, this is the tagline. It, it did a pretty good job, but I wanted to add my own kind of like language around the edges because it sounded a little bit stilted and you'll hear that as i'm asking some of the questions these questions during the show i asked chat gpt to write the questions but i, I needed to tweak them a little bit so it sounded more well, and authentic. it's based on what's been asked before so it's going to sound a little like you know it's not creating necessarily necessarily new things i want to also add just to the because like to kind of maybe maybe i'm an optimist just to allay the fears about academic cheating. And I'm going to, my, my husband is a professor and actually wrote a, what I thought was a pretty interesting article about this in the Atlantic, um, the end of last year, just making the point that, you know, these are all free tools right now. And it's a sandbox and it's a playground and everyone can kind of go and make their college essay on it. But it's extraordinarily expensive to run these tools and they're not going to stay free. And eventually, you know, there's going to be, they're going to be incorporated into something where there is money, there's a use case for it. And that's where they're going to be used, or you're going to have to pay for it. And that's going to also make it easier to tell who is using it. So I'm not, I'm not sure that it's always going to be the case that like anyone can just hop on and use the best, you know, chat GPT, you know, generator to generate their there, uh, you know, it might be a now problem, but I'm not sure if it's a forever problem. Well, that was that was actually interesting. I think I saw an exchange on Twitter where someone in the tech space, because a lot of us see this and it's free, and we're like, we assume it costs nothing to produce, just like with but prior to paywalls on news websites. We we're like, ah, oh, yeah, you know. Um, but the a smart tech person asked, well, what are the server costs associated per use on this? And I thought that was a smart question because it shows that. You know, the, there are limits to how free this it technology is. It is apparently extraordinarily be. expensive to run this, right? To do it free right now, especially with, but it's getting a lot of buzz and people are learning about it. And there's, you know, there's. And the costs value. always decline. I remember how when CD players first came around, I think people would say, oh, well, this is just for the rich. Yeah, but it's the computing, like the computing cost of it is is very high. So maybe it comes down over time, but right now it's 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 expensive, and I'm not sure how long it's going to just be anyone can like screw around with Dolly. And so I have two more topics that I want to get to because uh, I know we've got a hard stop in ten minutes, and I think David has to hop off here in in five minutes, which is okay because he did, said he didn't want to talk about the IP stuff or didn't have much to add <laughs> on the IP stuff. Well, we'll cover that on the last question here, but I want to I want to ask about deep fakes. And I want to start by playing some audio for you all. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? So that's actually a video that I saw on social media, and we'll cut that into the video version of the podcast. Uh, but it's someone standing in front of a camera, uh, and that someone is Morgan Freeman, but it wasn't actually Morgan Freeman saying those words. And I was talking to one of my colleagues about this, and he says, right now, uh, there's AI-based deepfake detecting technology that has kept up with deepfake production. So it's, it's pretty easy if you have the technology to determine what is a deep fake? But this looked exactly like to my to my untrained eye, Morgan Freeman, and it sounded exactly like Morgan Freeman. And 
I'm, you know, with all new technologies, of course, there are this, there's scaremongering and there, you know, but could we have a real kind of war of the worlds type panic happening as a result of deep fake? And I imagine none of you would say that this sort of thing would be protected speech, or maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it could be fraud or misrepresentation, depending on how it's used. In that case, Morgan Freeman, the AI generated Morgan Freeman said, I am not Morgan Freeman, full disclosure, but you could imagine a world where, you know, they do that with then President Barack Obama, and and people think it is actually him. What are the so, thoughts on deepfakes? Um, this this is an important subject. It's also like so much not really a new subject. Um, my understanding is that when writing was much less common, people were much more likely to look at a what seems to be a formal written document and just presume that it must be accurate because after all, it's written down. Maybe it was filed in a court and so on and so forth. But then, of course. As it became more common, I think we are all familiar with the po possibility of forgeries. It's true that we kind of grant most documents kind of an informal presumption of validity if it looks serious. But if somebody says, wait a minute, how do you know it's not forged? I think it's pretty easy for people to say, oh, yeah, or very likely that people react, oh, yeah, right. Uh, we need to have some proof. We need to have some authentication, often through the testimony of a person who says, yeah, yeah, I'm the one who wrote it, or here are the mechanisms we have for detecting forgeries and the like. So I do think that uh, that uh, uh, if if somebody puts up a video that purports to be some government official doing something bad, then and it turns out it's a deep fake, I think the person can say, look, you know, we all know about deep fakes. Uh, this is one of them. I never did it, did that. Just like if you were to send a letter, post a letter that I supposedly wrote, the answer is I didn't write it. I believe like in the late 1800s, there was some, some I think, forged letter, I want to say by then candidate James Garfield uh, that would played a big role in the election campaign. It turns out it was a forgery and I think it was denounced promptly as a forgery. Uh, one interesting question is to what extent will people who really are guilty of what's depicted in the video say, oh, no, 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 all deep fake. I didn't do that. I'm not. Why do you believe this nonsense? It's obviously faked, right? It's kind of like the I've been hacked defense of, you know. Pardon? <laughs> the I've been hacked defense. Of it. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. The I've been hacked defense. So one possible problem isn't so much that people will believe too much. Uh, although it may be that at some visceral level, the fact we've seen it, even if we know it's fake, will still kind of absorb it, will still color our perception of the person, maybe. Part of the problem may be that people will become even more skeptical. For fear of becoming too credulous, they will become too skeptical. And as a result, people will become very hesitant to believe even really important and genuine allegations about misconduct by people or by governments or by others. Um, but uh, so I do think it's going to be a serious problem. I do think it's important to realize that the question that this is just a special case of the broader problem of forgery. And if you think as deep fakes as basically video and audio forgery, then I think you see the connection uh, more than uh, uh, more than uh, uh, if you just sort of have a completely new label for it. In fact, I just came up with this. I think I'll blog it later today. <laughs> I I I I I agree. You know, and going back, it was one of the reasons, right, that you know, libel was a more serious offense than than slander was, was because of the inherent reliability of the of the written word. And you know, it, fortunately, I guess we've had common law has had you know thousand years of dealing of 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 creating you know, sort of a series of legal remedies for based on on falsity, um, whether that's damaged reputation or or emotional distress or, or whatever. And, and I do think we, you know, in terms of legal frameworks, you know, we, we look for to see whether those remain sufficient uh, for, for this new type of, of false statement. Um, and, and it'll be interesting, but I, I agree. I think societally, the idea that maybe we just don't know what to believe anymore is going to be the much more difficult thing to get used to than tort law. Well, that's one of the things you see uh, in societies where there's, <laughs> I, I read Peter Pomerantsev's book, uh, uh, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which is about kind of the state of modern Russia where they just kind of flood the zone, the zone with shit and nobody knows what to believe uh, anymore. And so as, as a result, they just become cynical uh, about everything. You could see that sort of situation happening where people To be are fair, Russians, <laughs> we've been cynical about everything for a very long time. <laughs> Not to be a media lawyer, but let me put in a plug here. Like one way out of this is 
you know, excellent journalism, because I think media literacy is important and not just believing things because, you know, you see a picture of it is not necessarily a bad thing, but you can authenticate. You can say, here's this thing. Here's what we did. We talked to this. We examined X, Y, Z. We here's like showing, explaining why it's consistent with, you know, why you feel comfortable reporting this and why you think it's authentic or why you're not sure. I think that's helpful to show people and and good journalists can use, you know, it, it's okay to have some healthy skepticism about, you know, sources, audiovisual sources like this. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I think explaining and showing people how to evaluate them is good media literacy and is good journalism. So I think that's right. Although one problem is this issue has come up at a time when my sense is people are much more distrustful of the mainstream media than ever before with good reason. That, that I think we would need to regain a notion of an ideologically impartial media uh, to do that. Not that the First Amendment say only protects ideologically impartial media. I think ideologically partial media are fundamentally important. Uh, that is say ideologically kind of one side or the other media are fundamentally important part of public debate. But when you're getting to questions about basic fact, like is this real or is this not, and people are afraid, oh, well, maybe the reason that they're not investigating this is because, you know, they have some agenda, some social justice agenda, let's say, or some traditional values agenda that's keeping them from doing it. Or uh, when they say it's uh, fake, is, are, is that being colored by their, by their preferences? Part of the problem is that those are really serious concerns uh, by David. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, today, I think they're much more serious than ever at a time when we need impartial media more than ever. David, we appreciate you joining us. I know you have to run. Yeah, I'm sorry I have to run. I, I have my canned answer also for the IP stuff, if you want me to say it so you have it, <laughs> you have the recording. <laughs> but, uh, no, that's okay. I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll probably cover what you're, what you're going to say anyway. I mean, the, the question to IP and David, and if you need to hop off, um, I'll, I'll let you, is you know, artificial intelligence has the ability to generate, and I'm, this is an artificial intelligence question right here. Artificial intelligence has the ability to generate original works such as music, art, and writing. And some have raised concerns that this could potentially lead to violations of intellectual property laws. So what are your thoughts on that, right? Like you say, we want this written in the style of so-and-so, or there's this thing going around social media where Dolly generated images of Kermit the Frog or Mickey Mouse, or there's this Al Qaeda inspired Muppet that has been going around and has kind of burned into some of my colleagues' brains. I mean, how do we think about that? I'm assuming what you'll say is we already have kind of a legal framework for for addressing that, you know, fair use and or substantial, and you know, or copyright. I mean, it doesn't really to me. It doesn't so much matter how you came up with the thing that looks exactly like the copyrighted work. If you are distributing it and, you know, doing one of the things that is covered by the Copyright Act, then it, I don't think it necessarily matters if you used a, a brush to make it or if you used a computer to make it. it, it like, we have a framework for that. Yeah, I think that's right. And I'll be my last bit before I hop off. But I, I think in terms of outputs from AI, it's, it's it, sure, AI could spit out potentially infringing materials uh, the same way that any other tool could. As well, I think the more the more difficult question, or I don't think it's difficult, but I think <laughs> I think an interesting question is um, in terms of the training of AI tools and using uh, you know copyright images for training. I certainly think that using those as you know inputs for training purposes, I think that's a fair use. That using copyright images in order to train an AI tool would be a fair use of those would be a fair use of, of those images. Uh, and then, but then the output certainly could be infringing and you would have to look at each individual output to determine whether, whether it was or was. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question there, David. I hadn't even thought. Now of. I have to go. <laughs> right, well, we'll let you go. I'll I've let, got to go in uh, five, so. Uh, yeah, Allison has a hard stop in five minutes. I, I, I think of, okay, so like you're using a copyright work to produce a commercial product, right? I think of when I'm, going when i'm going to usaa my uh insurer and we're talking about what i need to insure with my home they say i can't look at your home uh, on google street view because we haven't licensed google 
Google, we haven't lic- created a license with Google to be able to look at your home through that product. That, that's uh, Eugene's looking that's skeptically at me. a strange thing for them to say, I think. Although, you know, who knows? Uh, um, I mean, that's what, they, that's what they told me. It sounded you know, strange to me. say all saying, sorts of things. I said I, got a, I said I have a split level home. You could go on Google Street View and look at it. They're like, no, we can't because we haven't licensed that technology to use in our insurance underwriting business. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Uh, Maybe that's okay. a liability issue. All right. Maybe there's some terms of use that we don't pay attention to in uh, Google. Uh, in Google Street View. But I will say, so while I agree with with what people have said generally, I do think there's going to be some important uh, uh, legal questions that are different. So let me give you an example. Um, So the Supreme Court in the uh, the Sonian uh, Universal case uh, uh, held that uh, 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 VCR manufacturers couldn't be held liable for copyright infringement done using the VCRs because that's just a tool. So you could say, well, likewise, AI developers shouldn't be held liable for the copyright infringement done using them. Like, for example, if you run run it and then use it in an ad or some such. As long as there's a substantial non-infringing use. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, but it's possible that the analysis uh, might be different for AIs. You might say, well, first, we can expect more copyright infringement detection, as it were, from AIs than we could from just a VCR. Another thing is the VCR manufacturer had com- w- w- complete had done nothing at all in developing its VCR that used anybody else's copyrighted works. It was only the use that might be infringement. Maybe you might say, I'm not sure this is right, but you might say if you are using other people's copyrighted work in developing, essentially in training your AI, uh, then that is a fair use. But only if you then also try to make sure that you're preventing it from being used by your users to infringe. Of course, there's also the complication that it may be that a lot of user stuff will just be kind of for fun. And even if it looks exactly, it is Mickey Mouse and it's just for home use, may, for non-commercial use, maybe that's a fair use. Whereas if you put it in an ad, it's not a fair use and the AI may not know what the person will ultimately use it for. So those are interesting questions. But at the very least, I think we can't assume that all the existing doctrines, such as contributory liability, will play out uh, in, uh, in quite the same way. One other factor is copyright law, unlike patent law, does provide that independent creation is not infringement. So if they create something that happens to look just like a Picasso, just happens to look just like a Picasso, that's not an infringement. But of course, you might say if the training data included the Picasso, maybe that was fair use at the outset in the training, but now you can no longer say it's independent creation because after all, it's not independent. It's very much dependent. Then what happens if they, if you deliberately exclude Picasso from there, but you end up, you end up using all sorts of other artists who are influenced by Picasso. Uh, maybe even including that they had some sort of infringing elements, but that nobody sued over. In any event, I do think this will raise interesting and complicated questions because the existing doctrines have been developed in a particular environment that's now a shifting. I am also just going to throw, and then I, I do have to drop, I think to be kind of the, the practical lawyer angle on this, one thing that I see as impacting the way this may play out is kind of that the, the Copyright Office, at least so far, has refused to copyright things that were just solely generated by AI unless there was substantial human involvement. And that's going to affect what you can do with these kinds of works because no one's going to want to, you know, rather than using an artist that you can hire and license their work from or do as a work for hire, use an AI and then have no right, they have no ability to copyright the output. And then it's going to be, you know, like it's not going to necessarily be a valuable commercial use if you want to be able to protect what you're using the AI to create on the other end in commercial sense. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was kind of the flip side, right? Is who gets to copyright right. the works produced by, it sounds like by nobody AI. right now. So, well, I know Allison has to drop off. So yeah. if she needs to drop, this was really fun. Yeah, that was fun. Allison. And then there was one Eugene, I'll let you finish up sure. there and give your thoughts. Sure. So I'm not terribly worried about people not being able to copyright AI generated works. 
uh, uh, that is to say, users not being able to copyright them. It's an interesting question whether they could, based on their creativity and creating the prompt. But let's say they can't. The whole point of copyright protection, it's not copyright being valuable in the abstract. It's mm-hmm. that it in, is that it, it makes possible for people to invest a lot of time, effort, and money in making a new movie or writing a novel or whatever else. If indeed it's very easy for you to create a, a work, we don't really need to stimulate the creation of that work through copyright protection. That is, say, very easy for you being the user. Maybe very difficult for OpenAI to do that. That's a separate matter. Yeah. Um, so, so to be sure, copyright law does indeed protect even things that are easy to create. Like you can, I can write down an email. It'll take me a, a half a minute and no real creative effort. That email is protected by copyright law. But that's a side effect of copyright law generally protecting textual works that people write which is motivated by a desire to create an to have an incentive to, to create if indeed if indeed a, a picture is is easy to create with just the relatively modest effort required to select a prompt and then sort through the results not such a big problem i think if that's not copyrightable now for a, for commercial purposes it may be important that the result could be used as a trademark essentially i oversimplify here but basically yeah. that if i create a logo using open ai uh, i should be able to stop other people from selling products using a very similar logo but i think trademark law would already do that trademark law um, already protects things that are not protected by copyright do you, do you think allison said as someone who works in the copyright space that the government isn't uh isn't copyrighting anything produced by AI. Do you think eventually we'll get to a place where it will? I'm sorry, that, that the law does not provide for this protection? You said the government. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, well, well, the, uh, what, what is it? The, it's not the patent. What, 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 what uh, government agency uh, issues copyrights? And I should know this because I have uh, some. On my there mind. is no government agency that issues copyrights. Copyright, a uh, work is copyrighted when you write it down, when you fix it in a tangible medium. You can, Write an email, and that's protected by copyright the moment you write it, at least under modern American law. Now, before you sue, you have to register it. But that's just a condition of filing a lawsuit. It's also a condition of getting some remedies. Um, so the question isn't so much if somebody is registering these copyrights. Uh, the question is whether the law offers this kind of protection. Just do we say that an AI-generated image is protected? And there the question is, to what extent does that reflect the expression provided by the supposed author? So if I just say, show me a red fish and a blue fish, uh, at most what I've provided is the idea of having a red fish and a blue fish. That's not enough to be expression. On the other hand, if I were to give enough details, then it may be that it's protected at least insofar as a literal copy uh, that includes all of the details that I've asked for might not be infringing. So I do think there is going to be some degree of protection if the prompt is sufficiently creative. Well, I think, Eugene, we should leave it there. It's just left to the two of us a lot of interesting uh, thoughts to chew on. You know, I imagine we'll have to return to this subject in the next couple of years because there will be litigation surrounding artificial intelligence and uh, the First Amendment. Uh, but thanks for spending the time today, and I hope to talk with you again soon. Uh, likewise, likewise. Um, a very, very much my pleasure. That was Eugene Volk, a First Amendment scholar and law professor at UCLA, David Green, the senior staff attorney and civil liberties director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and Allison Sherry, a partner at the law firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. This podcast is hosted by me, Nico Perino, produced by me and my colleague, Kerry Robison and edited by my colleagues Aaron Reese and Ella Ross. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram by searching for the handle Free Speech Talk. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. We also have video versions of this podcast available on So To Speak's YouTube channel and clips available on Fire's YouTube channel. If you have feedback, you can email us at so to speak at the fire.org and you can leave us a review. Reviews help us attract new listeners to the show, so please do. And you can leave those reviews on any podcast app where you listen to this show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening.